In this video series, we're going to examine some experiments that photochemists apply to draw conclusions about how photochemistry works. We have seen some experimental data at this point and the results of a variety of experiments. We're going to really get under the hood of some techniques in this series of videos, particularly absorption and emission spectroscopy, methods for measuring the lifetime of an excited state species in various ways, methods for measuring quantum yield, and methods for looking at excited state molecules in very contrived, low complexity situations at low temperature in matrix isolation. And these, of course, are really the bedrock of our understanding and advancement of photochemistry. Application of these techniques is going to continue into the future as we develop new photochemical reaction mechanisms, applications of photochemistry, so on and so forth. We're going to begin with a look at electronic spectroscopy. And electronic here just means that we're using light to excite a molecule to a higher electronic state. So we can distinguish electronic spectroscopy from vibrational spectroscopy, infrared, Raman, and rotational spectroscopy based on microwaves. We can break electronic spectra into two classes, either absorption spectroscopy. And the idea here is that we're dealing with a sample in its ground state and using light to excite that sample and looking at how much light is absorbed as a result of, trans of a transition to a higher energy level. And of course, the flip side is emission, where we still use light to excite the molecule, but what we're measuring is the light emitted by the excited state. So we get some different information from absorption and emission spectra that really complement each other about the excited state and the ground state. So we'll look at that in detail in this video. First, let's talk about ultraviolet visible spectroscopy as an analytical method. So, of course, generally speaking, we need to use either ultraviolet or visible light to convert a molecule into its excited state, to excite a molecule to a higher electronic level. And the device used to do this is a UV vis or ultraviolet visible spectrometer. This is a double beam instrument that uses a reference beam to avoid issues with fluctuations in the light source as the experiment takes place. So to kind of work our way through this diagram of an ultraviolet visible spectrometer, I want to start here at the light sources. We have separate sources for the ultraviolet and visible light. These are combined via a mirror, mirror one, into a single light source. This, is pa this passes through a series of slits and a diffraction grating to select a particular wavelength of light to measure. And then right here at point two, we reach a beam splitter which divides that light wave into the reference beam which goes through a reference cuvette, passes through a lens and hits a detector, and the sample beam which heads through our sample and again is focused by a lens and hits a detector. So we get two measurements out of this our reference intensity of light that passes through the reference cuvette and our measured intensity of light which is likely attenuated or diminished relative to I0 as a result of absorption by the sample if absorption takes place. What we call the absorbance, A, is a measurement of the amount of light absorbed by the sample. And for colored samples, the extent of light absorbed can actually be quite large. So absorbance uses a log value to account for this and it's the log of the sort of reference intensity, the intensity of the incoming light. Presumably here, the light entering the sample has an intensity of I0 divided by the intensity of light transmitted, which is measured by detector one. Placing I0 in the numerator ensures that absorbance is going to be a positive value when light is absorbed, since I0 over I will be greater than one when light is absorbed. When we're doing an absorption experiment and looking at the amount of light transmitted or equivalently the amount of light absorbed by a sample as a function of wavelength, what we're generating is an absorption spectrum. It depicts absorbance on the y-axis or more commonly you'll actually see the molar absorption coefficient epsilon plotted on the y-axis. This is independent of concentration and the path length of the cuvette through which the light passes as a function of either wavelength or frequency, and very commonly frequency is expressed in units of wave numbers. You'll see a bar or a wavy line used over the letter nu when that's the case, and the most common units for wave numbers are inverse centimeters, essentially waves per centimeter, or inverse micrometers. You'll also, also see in some older literature, again, waves per micrometer. That's a little bit of a more human-friendly number if we're talking about electronic transitions, which can be in the tens of thousands of inverse centimeters and greater. So here's our definition of absorbance. 
that we just looked at. It's the base 10 log of the incident power divided by the transmitted power of the light hitting the sample. And one thing we should note is that electronic spectra are profoundly solvent dependent. While we can look for broad features in an absorption spectrum to recognize electronic transitions, transitions between different electronic energy levels, if we want the vibrational structure of the excited state, transitions to specific vibrational levels in the excited state potential energy surface, then we need to make a judicious choice of solvent and other conditions in order to achieve that. So very commonly in polar solvents, the vibrational structure is completely blurred out. So this is a typical appearance of an absorption spectrum with the molar absorption coefficient on the y-axis and the frequency, let's just call it a wave number on the x-axis. And there's no vibrational structure here. We can identify the most likely transition right here at the top of the peak, but we have no idea where the specific vibrational levels fall within this broad kind of Gaussian shaped peak. In a nonpolar solvent, we can start to see those vibrational levels to some extent. And so you can see these specific sort of sub peaks within this broad structure in the polar solvent are emerging in the nonpolar solvent. And these correspond to various transitions between vibrational levels in the ground and excited states. So the ground state is typically in its zero vibrational level. The lowest energy transition is going to be what we call zero, zero between the ground state vibrational levels of the ground and excited state. We could have zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, etc., up to higher vibrational levels of the excited state as a result having higher energies and appearing further to the right when wave number is plotted on the x-axis. Confusingly, I'll just mention, you'll also see wave number plotted increasing to the left because that's consistent with wavelength increasing to the right, which historically has been how absorption spectra were plotted. And so you can see wave, wavelength, energy, energy backwards, these all appear on absorption spectra. And you want to be very careful to correctly interpret what's going on with this x-axis in any given absorption spectrum. One last thing I'll mention, which I briefly alluded to, is that when you see vibrational structure, absorption spectra give you information about the excited state vibrational levels. This is an important distinction from emission spectroscopy. And the reason is that when we excite a sample in an absorption experiment, we're doing so from the ground vibrational level of the ground state up to the various levels of the excited state. And so you can see that the various transitions that we observe in this spectrum differ in the excited state vibrational level. If you see vibrational stru structure in an absorption spectrum, it corresponds to the excited state vibrational levels, not the ground state levels. From the shape of an absorption feature, you can get information about the oscillator strength associated with the corresponding transition and information about the kinetics of that transition in the form of the radiative lifetime or radiative rate constant for that matter, which is just the reciprocal of this. So say for example, we were dealing with a particular absorption feature in an absorption spectrum, wave number on the x-axis, molar absorption coefficient, on the y-axis. I haven't mentioned this yet, but this corresponds to some transition between electronic energy levels, right? And so we might imagine, just for the purposes of illustration, this peak corresponds to excitation of an electron from the HOMO of the molecule to its LUMO. To determine the oscillator strength associated with this transition, as well as the radiative lifetime, we need to make use of essentially the area under the curve of this peak, which we could call A, and it's simply the integral of the molar absorption coefficient with respect to wave number or frequency or wavelength. With proper corrections, these are all gonna result in the same number. The oscillator strength is actually directly proportional to the area under that curve. And I'll just present this equation without proof. If we're talking about excitation of an electron from say a level M to a level N, the oscillator strength associated with that transition is 4.319 times 10 to the negative nine molar centimeters squared times this absorption value. Notice that if we look at the units of A, this is gonna have units of inverse molar, inverse centimeter for the absorption coefficient plus another inverse centimeter term for the wave number multiplication. And so to ensure that F is dimensionless, the units of this kind of constant of proportionality need to be molar or mole per liter times centimeter squared. If integrating under this curve is difficult for some reason, we can approximate the feature as a rectangle, basically saying that there is some maximum 
epsilon right here, and we can look at the full width at half maximum wave number width of the feature basically approximate the area under the curve as the box formed by these two dimensions and then multiply by a constant that is of course slightly different in order to calculate the oscillator strength and again this is convenient when integrating the absorption feature is inconvenient for some reason. Now what about the radiative lifetime? Well to determine that we make use of the frequency or wave number of the transition, the molar absorption coefficient, and the width of the feature in terms of the full width half maximum, which we looked at over here, the width of the peak at half of the maximum absorption coefficient. An emission spectrum is sort of the other side of the coin of absorbance. We still use a light beam to excite the sample, but now we're measuring the intensity of emitted light rather than how much light is absorbed by the sample as a function of the wavelength or frequency of light emitted. And that's important to understand here that what we're scanning is the wavelength or frequency of light emitted, not the light impinging on the sample. In fact, the wavelength of light impinging on the sample provided it is smaller or shorter than the wavelength associated with whatever excited state we're trying to reach, that wavelength doesn't matter too much because of Cauchy's rule. We can excite to a higher vibrational level, even a higher electronic state in some cases, and rapid internal conversion vibrational relaxation will often return us back to S1 very quickly. You'll also hear these referred to as photoluminescence spectra since we're using light to promote luminescence or the emission of photons. Fluorescence spectra, for singlet emission, emission from a singlet state, and phosphorescence spectra for emission from a triplet state following intersystem crossing. So here's an example for pentacene, the fluorescence spectrum of pentacene. Here you can see the normalized emission on the y-axis. The actual value doesn't have a ton of information embedded within it. It's all about the relative emission as a function of the wavelength of that emitted light. And here wavelength is plotted and we can see various emission features corresponding to emission potentially from different electronic excited states, S2, S1, etc., or different vibrational levels within a particular excited state, just like absorption spectroscopy, we can sometimes resolve that vibrational structure in emission spectra as well. The difference here, and this is key, is that if we do see vibrational structure, it corresponds to vibrational levels of the ground state, because when we excite the molecule, any emission happens from the ground vibrational level of the excited state because of rapid vibrational relaxation. So for example, we can compare the vibrational spacing in an emission spectrum with the infrared spectrum of our sample and look for the vibration that is associated with this relaxation back to the ground state, right? If I see a spacing of 1700 per centimeter in the emission spectrum between vibrational peaks, and I know I've got a carbonyl group in my sample, I can be pretty confident that it's the carbonyl stretch that is associated with relaxation from the excited to the ground state and these various vibrational levels that that relaxation can happen to. When we look at absorption and emission spectra together, some interesting phenomena become apparent. Very often, absorption and emission spectra have a mirror image structure. Particularly this will happen when the structures of the ground and excited states are very similar, so that their vibrational levels are very similar, so on and so forth. Naively, we would expect the wavelengths of maximum absorption and emission to be the same, since, say, the zero-zero transition is associated with the same energy going up or going down. This is very commonly not observed in practice, and there's a shift from the absorption wavelength maximum, here it's 531 nanometers for rhodamine 6G, and the emission wavelength maximum, which is 552 nanometers. This is what's called Stokes shift. And it points to structural differences between the ground and excited states. So if we think back to the Frank Condon principle, if the excited state is very different in structure from the ground state, then we will excite not to the zero vibrational level, not to the ground vibrational level of the excited state, but to a higher one. Right? And then rapid vibrational relaxation is going to be associated with this Stokes shift from a shorter wavelength to a longer wavelength of emission. And it's profoundly solvent dependent since solvent can modify the structure of the excited state, right? Can, can modify the energies and the equilibrium structure of the excited state. This second example 
shows a profound Stokes shift from all the way at 465 nanometers of absorption maximum to 628 nanometers for the emission maximum, indicating very different structures of the ground and excited states. And it's worth noting in the structure that we have an electron donating group on one side in the form of the dimethyl amino group and a couple of electron withdrawing groups on the other side in the form of the cyanos. And this suggests minimal overlap between the HOMO and LUMO and a HOMO-LUMO transition associated with significant charge transfer from the nitrogen across the molecule to the cyano groups. This can sometimes be associated with large Stokes shift since there's a lot of structural change going on when we shift that charge a great deal from the right side of the molecule to the left. Finally, we've got to say a brief word about time resolve spectroscopy, where we measure the time dependence of absorption or emission to give what's called a time resolved spectrum with time on the x-axis and absorption or emission at a typical wavelength, at, you know, at a characteristic wavelength on the y-axis. You'll sometimes also see these in three dimensions with the entire absorption or emission spectrum plotted as a function of time. What kind of time resolutions can we achieve? It is now routine to achieve femtosecond resolution, measurement of data points with a frequency of 10 to the 15th per second. Attosecond resolution is kind of the next step shorter, 10 to the negative 18 seconds in between measurements is really the state of the art right now. And so you may see full spectra at various time points, not plotted on a 3D graph, but just with the various lines associated with various time points on a legend. We may also see the decay at a single wavelength, for example, the absorption maximum or intensity maximum at that characteristic wavelength for absorption or emission. For example, here we're looking at the photoluminescence intensity as a function of time, and note the time scale here, it's, it's nanoseconds. So great resolution given that one nanosecond is about this distance, we're getting a lot of points between zero and one nanoseconds. And of course, time resolved spectroscopy can be used to measure things like lifetime, reaction progress as a function of time, reaction rates, so on and so forth. 